they chasing the fame But they ain't got what's running through these veins Make way for the king Not checkers, what can I say? I got goat jeans. Real kings do king things. Live like it's running through these veins. Make way for the king. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. So this is our third year, I think, doing this debate. Um, and uh, we, I appreciate, first, I'd like to say thank you to Anthony for putting this together uh, and to, to Steve for being such a good sport here. Thank you. So we'll go right into it. Thanks. So if we can get these, let's see if we can get the slides up. OK. I'm going to go straight into it. Why don't you take a look at this slide? These slides, um, I do different stuff. I'm an attorney, but I also am in the oil and gas business. And in the oil and gas business, it's a little different than the practice of law. In the practice of law, a lot of times you're dealing with microeconomics. Microeconomics is going back and forth in your day-to-day -day negotiations of what you do in your business. But there's also such a thing as macroeconomics, okay? It's the big picture stuff. And in my oil and gas business, we're doing global, global deals. You gotta look at global markets and what happens really high up. And over the years, I've noticed that the insurance industry is starting to roll itself up. Insurance companies right now no longer, they no longer adjust claims by themselves. They outsource them to third party companies. The largest of which is Sedgwick. Now Sedgwick does billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars of claims management a year. And they do this for the insurance companies. And they charge lots of fees for that. And what they do is they look at the big picture and the big picture of what's happening. And very often, sometimes, we lose the forest through the trees. We see stuff what's right in front of us, but we don't see what's happening at the big picture. This is what happens in the insurance industry, the claims business. On the right is in 99% of the time, 99% of the cases, what is at issue is causation and damages. That's what's issues. And only 1% or so are we really talking about the, the, the interpretation of the law or the policy or whatnot. After storms and first party cases, most of it is the physical damages and causation. Now, when you make a claim against your insurance company, they're an adverse party. You are actually calling a claims department that is adverse to you and a big giant corporation that is adverse to you, that's vertically integrated. It's often worth billions of dollars, okay? Now, in personal injury cases, which I used to do prior to Katrina, if someone is rear-ended in a car and their back is damaged, their back is hurt, someone is hurt in the car, and they have to make an insurance claim against the car that hit them, you wanna know the percentages of people that do that without a lawyer or professional help? It's like three, four percent. Most people understand that we need to have professional help because there's professional help on the other side. In the claims business, there's only 2%, one to 2% hire lawyers. And we also know from public records, only 1% sue. Now, what does that mean to you? There are big giant corporations that are creating pie charts like this. Now, they know that only 2% hire lawyers only 5% hire public adjusters. And most of the issue is having to do with damages. And what they also do is they know if we can influence people about their perceptions, it can change things. They know if we tell lies, big enough. If we tell a lie so big, and this is propaganda that goes back into the ages. You tell a lie big enough so big, and you make it so large in front of people, it almost becomes undeniable because it's so big. I, I love this, this cartoon. 
And they're looking at this, and the guy says, it's so big. It's so impressive. It's so real. Wow. What's the big lie of insurance? That when you make a claim, they're on your side. That when you make a claim, you're in good hands. They're like a good neighbor when you make a claim. Now, this, these are amounts that were spent in one year on these slogans and this advertising. Over and over and over again that they're on your side. And we want, now we know why people don't get professional help. 93%. Because they think, they've been told, well, let's wait and see if they're fair to me. But what's actually happening is they're calling big corporations. Now, this is what happens. This is the financial alignment or when you make a claim. Now, this seems very obvious when you look at it. Of course, on one side, you have homeowners that are trying to maximize. And on the other side, you have shareholders of insurance companies that are trying to minimize. On one side, you may have an adjuster or a lawyer and a contractor trying to maximize the benefits. On the other side, and an engineer, an adjuster, a lawyer trying to minimize in that corporation. Now, the problem is those scales are balanced 2% of the time, only 2% of the time. Why? Part of it's money. Because all of our policy premiums go, all of them go to the corporations that are there that have a financial self-interest to minimize the claim. Part of our policy premiums, the adjustments are baked into it. We don't think about that. But when we step back, that's what's happening. There's nobody paying for the stuff on the other side. So what happens? Only 5% of the time do people pay for help because they have to come out of their pocket because it doesn't come out of the, could have come out of the policy premiums. It's only 5% that they get an adjuster. There's an adjuster on both sides, only 5% because of money, because that's what's being paid for by the policy premiums. Now, in, 90, in 93 to 97% of the time, there's been a safeguard for years about this. There's been a safeguard because at least everybody had a contractor there that was standing, or someone standing there to help. Someone there documenting the actual damages, documenting, taking photographs. And they can send that information in as proof, as eyewitnesses that are aligned with the same financial interest as the homeowner. Now they studied this. They studied this pie chart. They look at it, the industry looks at this stuff and says, wow, you know what? The 93% though, the five, only 2% could sue us. 5% are really level in the playing field because they've got adjusters. And heck, we're not worried about the one, because only 1% are suing. That, that's a rounding error. But we're not getting away with it as much as we'd like to and minimizing it because these pesky expert eyewitnesses are there to stop us. So what did they do? They started to target the contractors. Why? Because you represent 93 to 97% of the market. That's why they started contacting them. And what did they do? And they looked at this. And the industry, very deviously, they got together and they started talking with public adjusters and some lawyers that handle claims for policyholders. And they found some potential self-interest because the 5% and the 2% got together and say, we want more market share. We want more. And why are we so small? And they looked at, and the public adjusters and some lawyers looked at each other and said, you know, we're so small, and I, they made a mistake. They either made a mistake. I think they did make a mistake because they did something that weren't in their self-interest. They said, look, we're going to get more market share. The reason we're not getting the market share is because 
in 99% of the cases, it's just damages. It's just causation. And these are the experts. And they do it for free. They don't need to charge us. They don't need to hire us to do it. So what can we do? Well, they teamed up with the industry and they went after contractors. Now this is a memo. This was a memorandum that the oldest public adjusting association in America gave an award to. Storm chasing contracts are criminals. UPPA, unlicensed public adjusting, helping policyholders without a license, is a vehicle of consumer fraud that preys upon some of the most vulnerable elements in our society. This is what the public adjusters gave an award to. The disaster stricken, the elderly, the unsophisticated, and those whom English is a second language. UPPA has become synonymous with fraud perpetrated by disreputable contractors, you guys. Ne'er-do-well storm chasers, you guys, and similar predatory inks. Storm chasers are criminals. And what was the crime? What was the crime? This memo is very interesting. That was given an award to. The fraudsters offer negotiating services as a free bonus. That was the crime. The stereotypical transaction involves the fraudsters, that's you guys, going door to door after natural disaster, advertising repair and negotiating services. And then once retains, the fraudsters engage in pro forma negotiations with the insurance companies. The population is made up, the, po the, the population is made up of contractors that negotiate insurance claims, likely doing no better than the homeowner himself to complete repairs. <laughs> really? This is what they want to do though. It's not enough. They wanted, they argued that contractors should go to jail for it, that it should be a class three felony. And in 42 states now, if you aid a policyholder, Without a, without a public adjusting license or a lawyer, you can be accused of a class three felony. Losses from you, this is what they suggested. Losses from UPPA may be addressed collectively through the enforcement actions of state attorney generals. Incarceration is necessary to stop you from being a fact witness, to stop you from pointing out damage to the insurance company. That's what they did. Now, that's what it does. It unbalances the scales. It leaves nobody to protect the homeowner. Nobody. So they can hire engineers. Many of you know some of the battles that I had in Sandy where we pointed out, we found out in Katrina that the guys were forging engineering reports. We went to Superstorm Sandy, we actually got an, insurance ex an engineering executive put in jail in handcuffs for forgery. I went to the attorney general. Okay? <laughs> Doing what they do. Now they were going into the attorney general's office saying that the people committing the fraud were the contractors. I said, the contractors, they have an alignment of interest with the policyholder. Why are they, are you kidding? Look at this. It's not only the same company, it's the same people that were forging them all the way back there in Katrina. And now we shut them up. Now, after UPPA has been passed, there was a surprising thing with the lawyers and the public adjusters because the pie chart didn't grow. It's very confusing to some of them why the pie chart didn't grow. I mean, now, it's illegal for you to help. You gotta hire public adjusters or attorneys. So why did the pie chart not grow? They were looking at microeconomics, not macroeconomics. Macro's the big stuff. And what happened? Now, the US forensic reports, the engineering reports that were on million dollar claims and others and the National Flood Insurance Program, now it has spread like a cancer through the industry. Forged reports, made up reports, because they're looking at the pie chart. It used to be that when they did that, you guys could push back. You could provide evidence. Now they can shut you up. 
And so now all of a sudden, the conduct's gotten worse. The conduct has gotten worse for everybody. And it got worse for the PAs, it got worse for the lawyers. Because they're going into attorney general's offices and saying that the problem after storms are the fact that it's the contractors inflating claims. Uh, I, they just didn't, I, I don't know if it's devious or they just weren't thinking what they were doing. They're going into the politicians and saying the problem after the storm is they're trying, is they're inflating claims as opposed to the fraudulent claims. This is the problem, and now it has gotten worse. Now, that hasn't been enough for the industry. It hasn't been enough. It hasn't been enough to leverage you and homeowners and lie about the self-interest. Hasn't been enough in attorney general's offices. They came up with new tricks. They came up with traps. And one of these traps, these UPPA traps, is very interesting that they're trying out. They started doing this a few years ago. They got a case that suggested they could do it. And now, this is what's happening. I have had more than six companies come to me last year and report this is what's happening. They're agreeing to ACV. They're saying, okay, we'll negotiate. This is the difference between ACV and RCV roof. Go ahead, start the repair. Start the job. We'll agree, 87, five, we'll agree. Start the job. Then halfway through the job, when you're asking for your RCV back, they're going, huh, oh my gosh. The contractor helped with the claim. The contractor aided the policyholder. And they're denying RCV. Okay? It's happening even when they hire PAs. Even when you hire a PA and a lawyer, they're doing this. So, what can we do about it? Well, first off, what you are actually doing is you are just arguing damages. You're arguing causation and you're arguing damages. That's what you're doing. But that happens to trigger the policy. You're actually acting as fact witnesses to causation and damages. Eyewitnesses. Now, that eyewitness in 99% of the case can trigger coverage. So they're lying and conflating the issues regarding whether or not you're negotiating the policies themselves. Now, I have some disclaimers that I wrote um, that um, those who are here, in the storm, here at Win the Storm, you can contact me. You can have these disclaimers. And I think some of these disclaimers I'm telling my clients can help you. Um, but that's not the only trap. They started using that, and I call these, there's a, there's a few of them um, in one of my speeches, I called them badger traps. Because very, 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 very clever lawyers okay, are looking at this stuff, okay, and leveraging for their side. Here's another trap that's been happening. The 10 and 10 trap. They know, they've been seeing things like this, people asking for overhead and profit. They know you use Xactimate, so here's what they do. Okay, start the job. Oh, we don't want to give you O&P. Okay, we'll give you O&P, overhead and profit. Start the job. You start the job, they pay you the 41, and then they say, you know, give me your sub invoices. Before I give you your RCV, give me your subs. No, I'm not going to give you your subs. Nope, you got to give the subs or I'm not giving it to you. And then they're saying, if you don't give us the subs, maybe it's because you're not holding 10 and 10. Maybe you're holding more than 10 and 10. Maybe you're paying commission. Maybe you have to pay your adjuster and you're holding 40. So I'm not paying your, I'm not paying your RCV. Now what it is, it's a little bit of a shell game that they're playing with these traps. It's like the guy in the street with the shells and the little ball. Oop. <laughs> want me to quit? Switch it? I didn't put okay. that up there. <laughs> Switch president. Is that you? Okay. So it's a little bit of a shell game that they're playing with you. Because they know what you're doing is just using Xactimate. 
just to come up with a number of a lump sum bid. That's what they know. But instead, they're suggesting, because you're using Xactimate, that it's a cost plus contract, which means you give your materials and your labors at cost, and then you add profit on top of it. They know that you're using Xactimate just to get to a number, but they're interpreting it to be a cost plus contract, which is a shell game, and it's not true, and it's a trap. Now, um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve, but th these things are very, very clever, okay? They're very, very clever. They're very, very clever little traps that they're creating for you to create leverage and stuff. What we have to do, and what's important with events like this, is to call them out and, and for you all to be educated. The difference between a cost plus contract, a lump sum contract. There's simple solutions to this stuff because most of it's based on deception. Thank you. First off, I would also like to thank Anthony. This is really cool, isn't it? The fact that I'm here doing this, and a number of you come up to me and thank me for being here, and I thank you for allowing me to be here, because as I told someone in the hall, uh, hopefully you learn from me and with my perspective on these issues, but I absolutely also learn from you. Uh, and I hear the things that are said, I listen, my clients uh, in turn are advised of positions, and I know some of you in the room who I've worked with have seen a change in some of the positions my clients have taken because of things I have learned, uh, but not on all issues. So let's talk about some of those. These are my six hot topics for 2020, and I'm gonna try to move fast so we actually have some time at the end to debate. All right, number one, waiving of deductibles. 2018, we have to unite at a CEO panel here, someone said, and stop the waiving of deductibles. And I agree. And for the past two sessions, what did I tell you? I told you I promised I would make it an objective of mine to end the waiving of deductibles in Texas. And you know what? We did it, right? No. We have a law now in Texas that passed because of the work of a combined group of contractor trade associations, uh, consumer advocates, the insurance industry. We worked together to pass a law to make it clear that every building owner must pay their deductible in Texas. Every contract in Texas now must have language that says that deductibles must be paid. I would encourage you to use language like this. I'll give you my email address at the end uh, to uh, make sure that it's available for you. You can get the language, make sure it's in your contracts. Additionally, we did not want people not to be able to replace their roofs because they could not afford their deductibles. So we put language in the bill when we wrote this and made it clear that you could finance your deductibles under legitimate financing plans. And they're happening. They're out there now. Real legitimate contractors are financing deductibles. Companies have shown up that are reputable, that are actually really collecting payments and allowing people to pay their deductibles over time. And those that don't will face credit reporting or collection. And that's just what we'd hoped would happen, and it did happen. But like anything else, there are people who refuse to go along and try to do things right. And I get stuff sent to me every day from people who are trying to get around the law by saying, hey, just make two payments and then we'll lie to the insurance company. I get these all the time now. So we're fighting that issue. Please, if you see violations of this, let me know. It's a great example that good things happen when we work together. So we see bad conduct on both sides. I get it. The insurance industry is not perfect but nor is the other side. So here are some of the issues that we're dealing with right now, and I hope by talking about them, you'll be mindful of them the next claim that comes along, and you decide whether or not to try to submit an insurance claim. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> whether or not you try encourage it's the homeowner to, do, to submit an yeah. insurance claim. That was a slip, wasn't it? Yeah. And we call it the reclaim scheme. And this is an example of one where they're on the aggressive against my client. 
The insured was actually a roofing contractor submitting a claim for his own building. And we're going after the bad insurance company, the contractor and the PA, because they've been dragging us along and they're not paying the claim. So I jumped on Google Earth. I looked at the building after this was sent to me to look at. I realized the building was built in 2012 because uh, I could see from the images. I bought my $39 hail report. I saw a hailstorm on my data loss, but I also saw a hailstorm back in 2012. So I looked a little bit into it. I sent a letter to the PA. I said, hey, we've been retained by the insurance company. We're doing a little investigation here. You know, please don't make any complaints against us yet. Let's investigate this together. The PA says, of course, Steve, and I know the PA. You know, let's work together on this. We're just really frustrated at that horrible insurance company. So I said, hey, I've looked at this, and there was a big hailstorm in 2012. Was a claim submitted then? And he said, well, yeah, but they replaced the roof. And it was a brand new building, and the roofer did it himself with materials lying around the shop. I get these all the time, guys, all the time. I said, I'm going to request the claim file. He said, oh, yeah, you know, OK, go ahead. But it was brand new metal. You know, they replaced the roof. And I said, I'm not buying it. I want an EUO. This was all within a couple of days. And what happened the next day? The insured withdrew the claim. The PA and the insured both withdrew the claim because they were trying to collect on the second time for the very same roof they got paid for in 2012. Insurance companies are reactive. They react to the abuses they're dealing with on a daily basis. Here's another one. We measured the claim. We paid for the gutters and the soft metals, but we didn't think the roof was damaged. It goes to appraisal. And guess what they learned during appraisal? There was a 2011 claim where they got paid and didn't replace the roof. So we cut a deal not to ask for our $58,000 back. The reclaim scheme is a real problem. And I encourage you to dig deep with your building owners and make sure they're not involving you in a scheme to get paid twice for the same damage. Is that insurance fraud? A material misrepresentation in support of an insurance claim. I think they both were. Did we do anything against those individuals? We did not report them, because I think they just made honest mistakes. All right? And so we are not out there trying to stick at anyone we can. All right? We look at the issues and address them when appropriate. Inflated estimates and invoices, John raised the issue. We can talk about what came first with these problems. It is an issue. But remember, what we owe for an RCV payment is the amount you actually spend. And what happened was a plaintiff got greedy. And they went to trial over a matter because the insured plaintiff was greedy. And they measured, the insurance company measured the ACV at $1.2 million. Big roof. We're going to measure it at 1.2. And they held back 482 and hold back. And they said, you can have the rest when you come back when the work's done. And they came back to get the depreciation, the general contractor. But he said, oh, but it was a really hard job. So we need 2.4 million. The insurance company said, but wait, we measured it under Xactimate at 1.7. That sounds really high. So the insurance company did a little digging. You know what they found? They found that the roof was installed by a subcontractor for $816,000, less than the ACV measure. And in this trial to a federal judge, the federal judge was not happy. And he said, the record shows the only amount actually spent necessary to replace the roof were the payments to the contractor, the subcontractor, and that's all they get. So what are the lessons here? Yeah, you're being asked for your subcontractor invoices now when you are a general contractor. Because in this case, someone got greedy, and they gave us an opportunity now by creating law that allows us to ask for it. And that's what we're dealing with. There is bad conduct on both sides. Remember the first year I was here, I read this story? All right? Guys, there were people in the industry who are killing your golden goose. They are. And I would encourage you to work cooperatively with us and address it when that conduct goes on, because it's not good for anybody. Fake documents we still get. Let's go past that. Let's, it goes on a lot. We see them. 
I commend the APA for what they're doing. I Thank fully you. support Thank the you. APA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But equally, I get really pissed off when people try to rip off my clients. All right? So let's make sure we root it out on both sides. Like this. Yeah. A real video. And in fact, I'm getting another one tomorrow. Yeah, I know, he was dealing with pop nails, so. All right, real quick, two more issues. For insurance proceeds contracts. All right, John alluded to this. How many of you use contracts where you do work for insurance proceeds? Yeah, kind of, you do, right? Well, I would encourage you to reevaluate that model. Because here's the problem we have, and I see this now with more and more regularity. Okay, we measure the claim at 16 million, right? Simple residential roof. You go put the roof on under your insurance proceeds contract, and then you come back and say, oh, you know what, but it actually costs 28 grand. All right, you supplement it, or you tell us after what you really think it costs. So the homeowner has a roof at that point, and I only owe the amount you actually spend to replace the roof. So under this insurance proceeds contract, who is the person that can sue me? Not you, right? The insured. The insured has a roof where they're getting the roof from the contractor for insurance proceeds. Do you think that insured has any skin in the game anymore? No, all right? Do I have an obligation because a contractor says they owe more? I don't think so. So I would encourage you to reconsider the use of those contracts. Lastly, UPA. Who's been arrested in the past two years for UPA? No one? We've been talking about this for two years and no one's been arrested? Okay, who's been sanctioned or fined in the past two years for UPA? No one? Wow, we keep talking about this, John, but no one's been imprisoned or sanctioned. Who's been sued for UPA? No one? Who's been accused of UPA? Yes, that's right, some of you have. And there is an issue there. But to call this this grand scheme by the industry and the PAs to get together to screw the contractors ain't right. What UPA has done is it has given a way to create a way to respond to really bad behavior. <laughs> like this, where contractors are demanding appraisal, pursuing appraisal, and paying for it. Is that UPA? If the contractor's paying for the appraisal and running it and doing it, choosing the appraiser, is that proper? Well, is it UPA or is it proper? Let's talk about is, either. Is, is it, it proper? Is it, is it UPA or is it proper? Because here's the thing about laws. Oh, there so wait, are we gonna get into the, let's get rid of the law speech, right? Well, why? But, but oh. you're a lawyer. Let's okay. talk about the law. We're now, talking so about a law. If we want to get rid of the law. About, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's a difference between a law and it being proper. Where I'm from, they used, 200 years ago, they bought and sold human beings. It was legal. It was wrong. It was improper. Why and do we have UPA laws? Where did, how did they come about, John? Where did the UPA laws come from? The PAs will tell us where they came from. The PAs were being accused of the unauthorized practice of law by the lawyers. So they needed a carve out to allow them to do what's essentially the practice of law. They worked hard to give themselves a licensed right to do what they do. And I respect that. So if this group thinks those are bad laws, you ought to go out there to all your friends who are here in that room soliciting your business and all those guys who sat on this panel and said, send me all your cases, you go talk to them. Because this ain't the insurance industry's issue. This is the P public adjusting industry's issue. So, also, something else that I think is improper and UPA. Why does a contractor have to cite the bad faith statutes in Texas in their estimates? Is there a reason that's necessary? Or have a contract with the homeowner where you say, don't talk to the insurance company, let me do all the talking to drive the insured out of the process. Guys, there are abuses that need to be addressed. 
But, but there is behavior that is not a Yupa issue. Pull out the North Texas Roofing Bulletin. I absolutely agree with what they say is not Yupa. And as I say every year, uh, when we come to this discussion, as we always do, this is what I teach the insurance industry. I teach them to be nice. And I think you should be nice because there is a gray area where we can work together to help Mrs. Smith get her roof as quickly and fairly as possible. Now, one thing that is happening that I'm excited about is instead of all this angst back and forth that there continues to be, and all the posts that people send me that are in all the forums that I can't join, all right? Uh, but I have people who send me stuff, so when you post really bad shit about me, it comes back to me, okay? I see it. Um, but John and Anthony and some con leaders in the contracting industry have gotten together, because uh, I've brought them together, uh, with leadership in the public adjusting community, and we're having a dialogue about this issue to see if we can all define better what is and isn't Yupa for everyone's benefit. Uh, we need a consensus on that issue. Also, we need to work on a uniform residential roof spec. I'm tired of hearing fights about this. We're all better off if the in insurance industry and the contractors can just figure out what you gotta do to replace a roof, right? I'm with you, that's something you've taught me over the past couple of years. We should work on that. sbadger at zell.com. Write it down. If you ever have something that bothers you or a complaint about something or just want to raise an issue, send me an email. I'll respond because I like the discussion that we're having. Thanks for having me. Thank you. <clears throat> First, I want to thank I want to thank Steve um, for what you said about the APA, all right? Um, I want to thank you for that. Because that's, in, because that's important. That's very important. Um, it was interesting, Doug Quinn, the executive director, we said, I said to him, I said, you know, we're going to go to the industry to ask them to endorse the APA. We're going to go to the Coalition of Insurance Fraud which creates the SIU units that goes to attorney general's offices that says it's all contractor fraud and sets up SIU units to target you guys. And we went to them and I said, Doug, that the industry is actually going to say that they're for APA. And he said, no way, they'll never let us in. I said, yes, they will. Yes, they will. Because what's the APA against? Insurance fraud. We're gonna to go to them. It's kind of like saying, yeah, I, I agree, rape is bad. Murder's bad, I agree. Insurance fraud is bad. Now, they don't say that they do it much or that it happens at all, but they have to say that. Now, um, we talked about, a lot of you clapped here when we talked about the collaborative nature of working with the deductible law. And I heard, that in Texas, that it is legal, it's illegal to waive deductibles. Unless you're an insurance company. But who is the party unless, to the contract? Unless, unless it's insurance company. So what they did with this law, it was a Trojan horse they tried to sell you. They said, we're going to make it all so that your competitor, your competitor can't waive the deductible. I'm sorry, but John, were slip, you in slip, any of the meetings they, about the drafting of this bill? Did you attend any of the sessions in front of the legislators and the committees over the intent of the bill? Because I will tell you, I was. Hundreds of hours, and not once did this issue come up. I know. Not and you, and once. You know, and you know what? Had I been there with your legislators that passed it, actually, I talked to them after you passed it. And I said to those legislatures, did they ever point out the fact that they can do it? Did they ever point out the fact that they could walk next door to the roofer next door, pick up the yard sign, call that roofer who doesn't have to pay the commission, who's going to be guaranteed a payment in seven days, that doesn't have the same risk and the same overhead, and say, we'll waive your deductible. Did they ever tell you that? And, you're, and, and, and the senator 
And the congressmen didn't know that. They weren't told that. Why? Because of exactly what he said. We were not in the room. Who's we? we? Were not, we Who, were whoa, not whoa. in the room. Who is we? Who is we? John Hodel, hoteling? Because Somebody who was who in knew the what room, you were doing. the C Roofing Contractors Association of Texas, yeah. North Texas Roofing Contractors Association were all in the room. And at no point did they raise any concern. Go take it up with them, all right? But what we have done is we've created something that actually is good for consumers. It's, it's good for you guys, right? That's what they said. Now, all of a sudden, if you talk to those associations, they go, damn. Really? We didn't see that. We didn't see the fact that you can waive it. Who? And what's happening now, who? what's happening who? now, what who happened on the floor. Who did you talk to with those what associations? What's happening on the floor now? Well, who? Yes yesterday, last night, the distributors, the, the companies that you're selling, the distributors, and all of that, we had discussions about not being in the room when this stuff happens, or not looking at the macroeconomic issues of the deal. You're still blinded by what's happening with that competitor, that you're saying, you know what, we gotta stop that when you don't step back and look at what'll happen. Here's what's happening next after the deductible law. Walking the floor of WTS, walking the floor and asking a roofing company, you know, we can work together. We can make you a lot of money. We can make you a lot of money. We can work together. A roofer came up and said that that happened today. Okay? Now, what's happening with that? What's going on with that? The fact is now they can waive the deductibles. Every insurance company that now picks your competitor can waive it. And you can't. So the policyholder's con choice of contractor is now more expensive than the contractor of the insurance company. Is that good for the consumer? And what do you think when you go and you say, we're gonna make some money? We're gonna make some money. Look at the macro, what's happening here, okay? Do you think maybe if we feed this guy lots and lots of money, he'll pull some punches when it comes to causation, when it comes to the quality, when it comes to repair versus replacement? Ah, uh, so we're back to the managed care, repair is managed bad. Care, it's not just managed care you have to worry about. They can literally pick up the yard sign of your competitor next door, and they can waive the deductible and you can't. And I can tell you, those legislators were okay. very, very, very concerned about that issue, and it wasn't brought up to them because we're not in the room. Here's what we have to start doing. We have to start being in the room, because there's an expression. When we founded the APA, if you're not in the room, you're on the menu. Okay. All right, so should we, should we repeal the law? You guys want to go back to how it was before? And we have, we don't. How oh, about so the same law for property? No, okay, so here, I need 30 seconds here. Same law if you crash so, your car. So, guys, we have two contracts here. We have my contract with my insured, all right? And both parties to that contract have the right to enforce or not enforce the terms of that agreement. That's between the two of us. Then you have your contract with the insured. That's a different contract, right? And the rights and obligations under that contract are your business. That was it. Absolutely. I do not. I absolutely, I, I don't, first off, I don't waive deductibles, right? I decide not to enforce a right <laughs> under my contract. Oh, yeah. It's true. Yeah. Are we waking up? Are we waking up? Oh, so Do John. Do you hear this? All right. Okay, now. So I'm going to show up at your, your American Ethane contract, and I'm going to say, I have issues that I want to inject now. into your contract now, with China. Here, now, here's So the can thing. I show up and change the terms? All right, we got to stop. We got to right, stop. They, they said they'll give us another 15 minutes, yeah? Another 15 minutes. Hey! All right. All right. Let's talk. Let's talk we got to go to something else now. No, okay. Let's go to something else. Let's talk about the Whitestone case, okay? Let's talk about the Whitestone case. Because What's the, a reasonable because, profit? Because the 10 and 10, because the mm -hmm. 10 and 10 badger trap, the 10 and 10 badger trap, what, what was done in Whitestone? Now, I'm not sure 
whether or not Mr. Badger understands the difference between a cost plus OMP contract and a lump sum contract. I absolutely I do. And I, uh, then I don't know if the judge did, and I don't know if the lawyers who represented them understand the very important significance of the difference between offered acceptance on a cost plus or a lump sum. I've been spending, I'll tell you, I've, I've now talked twice at C. Patrick's OMP seminar. And I asked the room, how many of you really understand the difference between a cost plus and a fixed price contract? And when I ask the questions, it's confusing. Here's what's happening and here's what they're doing. I have no problem with an honest debate or different positions. I have a problem when someone says I'm on your side if they're lying. I have a problem if it's a shell game. I have a problem if they're saying, this is good for you, when it's bad for you, and it's a trick. That's what I have a problem with. And the problem with the ONP stuff is this is what they're doing to you guys now. You want ONP. We're here and Steve Patrick talked to 10,000 people about how to get ONP, 10,000 uh, contractors a year. And they're hearing this and they're listening to that. And they're saying to you, okay, you want ONP? Okay, you got it. Here's what they know, if they know the difference. I was giving you the benefit of the doubt that you didn't. But let's assume you then the fact that you do know the difference. Here's what they're doing to you. They know that you're using Xactimate as an analysis tool of the market. And they know that you're using it to get the bottom line price. They know that's what you're doing. But when you ask for OMP, you trigger in your language that you're gonna give the cost and materials at your cost. That's what you do. And what did and I they, say a few minutes know, ago that I recommend you do? You go to a fixed price contract. Thank you. I agree with that. Let's get rid of insurance thank proceeds thank contracts. You. Thank you. John and I had a Harvey claim. John calls me up and says, Badger, do you represent so-and-so? I said, I do. And he said, well, I'm about to sue him. And I said, don't sue him. Let's talk about it. So, we got all the info together. John had a contractor Xactimate estimate that was considerably higher than my independent adjuster's uh, Xactimate estimate. Imagine that, right? So I said to John, let's get out of the Xactimate world because in my view, it's actually general mate, right? There's nothing exact about it. So why don't we bring in a real, good contractor who actually fixes damaged buildings and tell us what it's really going to cost. And John said, are they good? Are they real? Are they legitimate? Will they do the work and do a good job? I said, absolutely. I'll give you references, even from a prominent Dallas plaintiff's lawyer who I referred them to, and he loves them. So we brought them in, and they wrote up not an estimate, but a bid. I love bids. And they wrote up a bid, and guess where it came? Right in the middle of the two. And you know what happened? We resolved that matter without litigation. So yeah, there's lots of problems with cost plus. Uh, I get it. I understand. But let's stop doing it. And then also, we have to decide whether we're general contractors or if we're roofing contractors. Because the whole Whitestone thing, asking for subcontractor invoices, doesn't apply if you're a roofing contractor and all of your profit is in your bid price. I don't have a right to push if you give me a real bid. Give me a bid and whatever your profit is, that's up to you. But then we can decide what to do with that bid. Are we on the same page with the use of bids? We are, however, Ah, damn! Let, no, however, let's go back and we'll talk about the facts of this. What happened, and this is important, it's a, it's a very, very good dialogue here. Because what happened is, I said to Mr. Badger, we need to fix the property. We need to fix the property. And he said, great, I'm going to come in, we're going to do an inspection. All right, great, that'll be good. And then I get a call that says I'm bringing an engineer. I said, a BCD? what? A bias causation denier. I said, I have a problem with this. I have a problem. Wait, wait. We don't need an engineer to rebuild this place. Why are you bringing an engineer? Because if you're bringing an engineer, Steve, because I know this game, I'm not playing games. 
and I said, we're going to cancel it. And if all you're doing is bringing an IA, is that true? No. You're bringing an estimator. I got one option for my client, which is my contractor. Only one. And, I, and your guys are theoretical, biased guys, and they don't give me a choice. So unless you bring a contractor who is going to be able to do the job, then we can talk. Okay? Now, in that claim also... And there was no disagreement there, right? No, no. That's and, exactly and, what and I we said. Got, and we ended, up, we ended up working out what it would properly cost to fix it. But there was another thing that happened in that claim. And that was the fact that the insurance company takes advantage of the fact that only 2% of people hire lawyers. And if you don't hire lawyers, then they don't have to often follow the 60-day rule of payment, which is, which is in almost every state. And they know that policyholders don't know how to trigger that law. And they know they have to hire a lawyer to trigger that law properly. And they also know it's tricky to trigger that law. And so they don't want you, when the, and you looked at the, it's, you can't possibly talk about the law of what it is, because they don't want you to. And the problem that we have here is all of the policy pre premiums of our payments go to pay those guys who are adverse to us. And they don't pay claims management, managers on our side. We are funding somebody who is adverse to our interests, and we are not funding the people that have an alignment of interest. And we are allowing those big corporations with all of their slogans to lie to homeowners and knock on the doors and say, I am an independent adjuster. I get paid more and I have a fine, so I get paid more the more your claim is done. Therefore, I have a financial alignment of interest with you when that's a lie. When there's a thing called exact analysis and we know how it works. And anyone that says that somebody who gets paid by the insurance company does not have a conflict of interest is not telling the truth. I have no problem with telling the truth. I have no problem of debating the truth. But we can't play the little shell game. That's what we can't do. With an honest debate, with an honest debate, with honest contractors, with real costs, then we can come to an agreement. So I refuse to accept that 98% of all the claims where there aren't lawyers or PAs involved, that my industry is screwing the homeowner. I refuse to accept that. You, do likewise, you, do you, do you admit? Well, hold on, likewise, right, I'm not going to sit here and say that 90%, 98% of all of you are scumbag assholes, all right? I'm not, all right? There are problems on both sides, and that's why we have public adjusters and attorneys. Now, one issue I'm going to help you with here. John says no one knows how to trigger our prompt payment deadlines. In Texas, it's really easy. All right, help the homeowner all right, have the tools that they need to provide all the information needed for the insurance company to reasonably investigate the claim. And what is that? As John said, in 99% of the time, it's causation, is there damage? And number two, what it's gonna cost to fix this, damage that exists. If you provide those two things, all these smart lawyers in the room, all right, Zach and Bob and all these Texas lawyers will know how to trigger the prompt payment deadlines and get it going right away. Is it okay to us to provide notice of those deadlines to customers? Uh, it's us again. being, is it for a layperson who's not a lawyer? Uh, is it okay for the insurance company to do it? Sure, they should. So, because here's they the problem. Tell people. It's not a matter of whether or not somebody is a criminal or not on the other side. He's not a criminal, okay? But he has a conflict of interest with your policyholders. He could not represent them. He couldn't represent the insurance company and then go in and knock on the door because he has an ethics, he has an ethics license. And the problem that we've had in the industry is that we're being myopic 
Plaintiff lawyers and public adjusters are being myopic about what's happening on the big picture. We're self-regulating ourselves so that it is illegal. I will get put in jail if I knock on that door. Now, is that in the best interest of the policyholder? I will get put in jail if I call them and say, you got to do this. This is the law. OK? All right, now. questions. Who's got a question? <laughs> yes, sir. The benefit is sitting in the front row. Hold on. Oh, we have a line. Oh. Um, guys, I'm going to okay. get his um, question, and then I'm going to go back to the space where we've been asking questions. Hi, how are you? How are you? Good. We are running late, so I'll, make, I'll make it short. So you said, you know, does the customer know or does the contractor know when to trigger that 60-day? And then it went to Badger. Badger said, yeah, you can explain to the client. Am I right? No. You can, well, I didn't. I, you can provide the tools, the information they need for the client to do it. So would that not be them assisting an insured acting as a public adjuster Absolutely. when they're directing the claim, whether it be a proof of loss? So the statute says that they cannot negotiate the claim. <laughs> so negotiate would be communicating with the insurance company. As long as the contractor is communicating with the, the homeowner and not providing legal advice, all right, they can talk all they want to give the uh, homeowner the information necessary to pursue their claim. So I want you to put a pin in there right now. What he just said was, you can talk to the homeowner, but you can't talk to us. The reason why, here's the unmasking. I'm going to take the shells up to show you where the ball is. Here's what this does, this law, and the bulletins, and the bullshit. Here's what it does. The problem is, is that if you provide it directly to the insurance company, it could potentially trigger their liability. They don't want that. They want there to be a problem. They want there to potentially be. If you're able to point it out, they want it to go through the homeowner who doesn't know, who isn't sophisticated in this, who doesn't know, who hasn't been on the roof. That's what they want, because they want leverage. It's not a matter of whether people are criminal or not criminal. It is just that there's a conflict of interest there. That's the problem. And the problem of leverage, the fact that only a, I can tell you, I can, I can tell you about cases where they've been sued and they're beta testing, big claims, after an appraisal award has been paid on a $3 million claim with an extremely good lawyer, one of the best here, and he's in the audience and with one of the best public adjusting companies and one of the best roofers here that people look up to. And after the appraisal award, after the appraisal award was paid, they sued the roofer for UPPA. Okay? So, we have to be careful. These, these laws are wrong. Let's be clear who they is. Who sued the roofer for UPPA? Who, who? sued the roofer? Yes. Who sued the, the roofer? The insurance company. Uh, are you sure of this? That's, that's not my case. All right. Well, if, if that's the case, I'd like to know about it. The roofer, right. the roofer, the roofer was sued, and it also happens. This is, and it, uh, and it's, let's and it's, and it's clarify a game. that. Let's this, have a beer over this, this issue after. This is, what, this is what also happens. You see, they know you're using Xactimate. And it's a cost plus, and that's a cost plus analysis, that's not it. And so what they do is, in the shell game of the 10 and 10 badger trap, this is what they do. They go and they know you're using that as an analysis tool to get to the number, and the number's the same. And then they pay ACV, or they pay the appraisal, or they do something, they pay, they pay some stuff on it, and then they come back and they go to your customer. They backdoor your customer, and they say, we're actually on your side, remember, you're good, we're your good neighbor. And then they say, you know what? He's not holding 10 and 10. He's committing insurance fraud on this claim. Are you committing insurance fraud on this claim? And they lie <laughs> about the nature of the fact that it was a lump sum and not a cost plus that we were talking about. It's a shell game. And the problem with this is that they 
the insurance companies and the giant multi-billion dollar TPA companies who are whippin' smart have come up with these traps. That they're telling people and they're talking to people that they have a conflict of interest with. And they're not telling them of what's in the best interests. And whether or not it's the insurance company or the insurance company going to the person and hiring the lawyer, it's wrong. All right, real quick. Every UPA lawsuit I've seen involves a building owner suing a contractor and not an insurance company. That's because I'd you divide like to know. Them. That's okay, because so. you misrepresent and you divide what's happening, whether it's a cost plus, whether it's a cost plus contract. Oh, wait, that's or UPA. That's a whole different issue. The, all right, who, question. Okay. Uh, all right, let's I go have, to the next I have, uh, before that, before we go, um, I, I really do appreciate Steve has been a really good sport. He comes here, and, uh, and I really appreciate it. I want to give him a round of applause. Uh, I, also, I also would like him. I'm donating a piece of the, my Star Wars collection to the APA if you're a new APA member. I also want to give this to Steve. Really? Yes. Um, so this was uh, this is a replica. Oh, I got to hug this <laughs> out. No. He this knows was, I'm a Star Wars fan. So this is a replica that was built. Um, David Prowse, who was the original, uh, who was the original Darth Vader, he signed it. Um, so this is an exact replica <laughs> of the original screenshot version. Oh, that's so awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Thanks, yeah, Sean. Awesome. I appreciate it. Okay. All yeah, right, we've got a few more questions out here. We uh, promise quick answers. I'll be real short. Quick question. Uh, Paul Malnick from Roofing Rochester, New York, in Rochester, New York. So something we've been dealing with a lot is uh, there's a, a Pretty famous argument that we come across is uh, direct physical loss. So what happens is there's a really old roof, like 25 years old, shingles blow off in a windstorm. The adjuster comes out and says, we're not gonna pay for the entire roof, we're just gonna pay for the shingles that are damaged because that's the direct physical loss. My interpretation is I'm not asking for siding and windows because the roof is damaged. And from my understanding, all policies have direct physical loss in them how do we combat that? What does it mean? And you know, how can we you know, argue that? Yeah, um, I'll be really quick. Uh, it, are are yeah. you a PA or are you a, or are you a contractor? Roofer. Okay. So the company owes for the physical loss or damage that's occurred. All right, it depends upon the state you're in, whether or not you're in a state that has concurrent causation or efficient proximate cause. It gets a little thorny on those issues. All right, in some states, if the main problem is the blow off, and the rest of the roof has to be replaced because a lot of the roof's gone, or there's an appearance and matching issue, you get the whole roof. In Texas, is a concurrent causation state. And there's a case called All Saints, which, mean, which says that I only owe for what's damaged and not the rest of it. Well, if it can't get repaired. Like well, there's a repairability issue. If it cannot be repaired, and the question is why. If there's a code issue, that's relevant. But if it's an old hardy slate tile roof and you can't repair it because you're walking around and all the, all the tiles are coming apart, under Texas law, that's not my problem. All right, the insurance company doesn't owe that. They just owe what's damaged. So, Come so find what, me after, so what, we'll talk so about it more. what should tell the insurance company? In that situation? Yeah. Uh, he should say, look, I cannot repair this roof for X, Y, and Z reasons. The code does not allow me to repair this roof. The manufacturer requirements do not allow me to repair this roof. Uh, and uh, talk about why you believe the roof is not repairable. Now, there's a lot of insurance companies that will just tell you that you just induced a felony. So, okay? my because, because this, and this is the problem with UPPA. You're asking a question which is very honest. And what are you really talking about? You're talking about causation, you're talking about damages. It just so happens that that may trigger coverage. But be nice. You just talked about. Be nice. Be bit. Yes, be nice. If you're nice to the insurance company and they like what you're saying, then you may not be accused of a class three felony. If they don't like what you say to the insurance company, then you can commit a class three felony. All right, two more, let's do two more quick questions. All we right. gotta get off. Uh, Pat Trapeal with Choice Remodeling and Restoration out of Hocus in Delaware. Um, big question, who makes the determination at these um, adjuster meetings? Ladder assist or the adjusters? <laughs> yeah, so I will tell you in all honesty, all right, I have told my clients, 
all right, that you should have license adjusters adjust every claim. I agree with that. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, I have a question. Steve, I have a what? question. I have a question. Adjusters, do you think that adjusters should be uniformly licensed? No, 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 no. If the adjuster, what if the adjuster has a conflict of interest with the policyholder? Doesn't a public should adjuster? It, should it be wrong, is it wrong, is it wrong for an adjuster who has a conflict of interest with the homeowner to not have a license? I believe insurance adjusters should be licensed. Yep, I agree, I would agree with that. And yep. should they have they are in my should state. they have they the should same be. have should they have the same standard of licensing? Is there any justifiable reason why someone with a conflict of interest should have a lesser re license requirement to someone that has an alignment of a Yeah, I agree with you on that. Right, that the public adjuster up, licensing requirement is too easy. It should be more stringent like the IA requirement. And so you think, I know, so, I, so you think, <laughs> so you think, so you think, no, 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 it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. So do you think that defense lawyers and plaintiff lawyers should, one should be able to go to law school and the other should not have to? So. That's not how it exists in my state. Well, I think oh, y'all answered right. this question, so let's get to this okay. question, okay. last one. Yes, how are you doing? Uh, we're a roofing company in, in San Antonio, and um, I'd like to ask about the uh, HB, H21, HB 2102, right? Yep. So what exactly are you guys doing to enforce the law? Because this is to prevent bad contractors that uh, are waiving deductibles and, and have the... Uh, unfair disadvantage, unfair, you know, competition. So, but you guys are really not enforcing anything. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're here. So, well, okay, so if you're aware of contractors who are not complying with the law, did you see my slide? Send me a damn email at sbadger at zell.com. I will report them to the TDI and the Texas Attorney General. Yeah, yes. but, but you guys are really not. Uh, so there's some contractors are actually telling homeowners, hey, don't worry about it. Uh, give us the check for the deductible because we have to prove it, and I'll give it back to you. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's a problem, so isn't it? Really, no, 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 but it's really not, not doing anything. It's, it's only it's a problem. Really, Hold it's on. It's really so, not enforcing anything. It, it's really not enforcing it's, anything. You guys are not doing anything. It's, so, only, it's only a problem. It's, just, it's only a problem, and, and I think the speaker needs to understand this. It's not illegal across the board to waive deductibles all for right, roofers. All right, so. It's not. Yeah. It's only if the homeowner has it. If Steve calls your competitor, if he calls your competitor legally under the law, the deductible can be waived. All right. So Yours can't if the homeowner has you. Call your local roofing group and ask them to ensure that they're enforcing the law. All right. This law is, we're doing everything we can to enforce this law. There's uh, three, 4,000 contractors in San Antonio and thousands more in Dallas and all over Texas. You really guys can, can, you can enforce any of Okay, so should we just give up yes. and not do anything and this let all these home customers get screwed? Whatever, whatever right? you did I mean, what do is we do? really, whatever you did is really not a, a solution. Okay. Well, I'm sorry really I anything. suck and I couldn't do a better job. Yeah, I mean, I wish you know, my I spent would say that. All right. Okay. All right? All right. Guys, All right. thank you very much. Hey, one hold on question. one sec. Oh. Thank you. One last Steve question. Badger. Yeah. Hold on. Hey. One last hold question. On. Hold on. We have the attorney panel coming up for more questions. You want one for one him? One last question. Oh. One more? One last question. Oh. One last question. All right, Steve. Hey, Badger. I'm in control of this. <laughs> <laughs> One last question, I'll be brief. Roof surface payment schedule. Is that an ACV policy with RC benefits or is that an RC policy? Because mortgage companies require homeowners to have replacement cost policies. In an RSPS, the, va the price that the insurance company pays diminishes 3% for every year that the, year that the roof ages. That's an ACV policy, sirs. Not if there's replacement cost coverage, that if they replace the roof. All right, so let's do this. I, um, I am gonna go to the VIP area. Anthony said I could sit over there and Hold answer on. questions, because I don't want to hear a bunch of yeah. plaintiff lawyers so talk. So I'll be over there. Bring me a beer, and I'll hang out with you over there go, and answer all your why questions. Don't we go to my booth afterwards at 5:30. Okay. All right. Hold on. We're gonna go. We're gonna go after <laughs> the attorney panel, which is next. 
After the attorney panel, Steve and I are going to go over to my booth that will be there. If you want to, we're going to continue. We'll continue Let's do that instead. 5.30 at John's okay. booth. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Way Thanks, to go. Guys. Round of applause.